So, yep, welcome everyone. Uh, it's lovely to see to see so many folk here, a nice mix of, of past and present students, as well as friends of the Centre for History from around the university and also externally. Um, and we are delighted to welcome um, our own lecturer, Dr Katie Turton, today uh, to give this talk for us. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes um, before we get started introducing um, Katie properly. Um, I'm sure you're all very aware of this. We've been doing online talks for long enough, uh, but just a reminder to keep your microphones muted um, until the end of the talk. And then if you want to, you can come in and ask questions. You can also use the chat uh, function, which is down the bottom right of the screen. It's the uh, speech bubble. You can click on that and you can send a chat message through that um, and we can pick those up at the end uh, if you've got any questions for, for Katie. Um, rather than coming in yourself through audio, that's absolutely fine. Um, so as a historian of women's participation in the Russian Revolution, Katie has employed a range of different strategies to integrate women into the history of the revolution. She took a broadly compensatory and feminist approach in her first book, Forgotten Lives, in which she was rescuing Lenin's sisters from comparative obscurity and dealing with them as historical agents in their own right. In her second book, Family Networks, she explored the daily interactions and cooperation between men and women in the revolutionary movement through the lens of family life specifically. And then most recently, she has turned to fiction writing uh, to explore the daily lives and loves of revolutionaries, including a romance between two women. So today, Katie's going to discuss her writing experience and compare the challenges posed and the opportunities offered by these three approaches when trying to write an integrated history of the Russian Revolution. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen because I'm going to share Katie's presentation for her and I will hand over to you. Thanks very much Nicola and thanks so much to everyone for well for inviting me along and for coming along to hear me. Um, yes Nicola will be my assistant here in past, uh, moving forward my PowerPoint as my own computer is just not up to the challenge at five o'clock on a Thursday so um, so, yes, as Nicola said, I've been uh, writing about women in the Russian Revolution uh, for my whole career. Um, and I've always been particularly influenced by Gerda Lerner's take on what the role of women's history ought to be. If we go to the first slide. Um, she sees it as a, a women's history as a worldview and a compensatory strategy for offsetting the male bias of traditional history. It's an intellectual movement of seriousness and considerable range, which aims for a new synthesis, which will eventually make its continuation unnecessary. And that idea of a synthesis where men and women are dealt with in history equally and given equal space has always inspired me. What I found, of course, like so many other historians, is that the practicalities of achieving that synthesis um, are actually quite challenging and um, as, as Nicola summarised I've tried a number of different strategies to, to do it. So for the first half of my talk then I will talk about the, the strategies that I used and, and how, um, how I felt they helped to integrate women into the narrative of the revolution um, and then I'll bring it together thinking about some key elements of, this write, of these writing experiences and see if scholarly writing or fiction writing has the edge in terms of integrating women properly. So, as Nicola said, my first, my first book, which was based on my PhD, was on Lenin sisters, and I did the classic women's history uh, approach of rescuing these relatively obscure women and uh, trying to restore them to the historical narrative. And I'll always remember when I was doing the conference rounds, talking to academics about my plans to do this as my PhD, and one big figure in Russian history dismissed them as mad hagiographers. Um, naturally, um, <laughs> it became my life's work to uh, refute that. And if we could just go to the next slide, I was kind of up against it because the prevailing attitude in primary and secondary sources uh, was that Lenin sisters were devotees to their brother and dedicated their entire lives to him. Um, Valentinov, um, his memoirs about meeting Lenin is the, the, the first example of what I coined the solar system myth. He's the one who really pioneers it, but lots of others take it up. So he says that uh, Vladimir Lenin was like the sun in the planetary systems of the Ulyanovs, whom Maria, his younger sister, almost idolised, and Anna, his older sister, saw as an oracle. 
service in every possible way became the absolute first worry and care of the Ulyanov family. They served Vladimir Lenin with special zeal in subsequent years. At the time of his stay in St. Petersburg, during his illness, at the time of his imprisonment, his exile and his emigration. And he talks about how they, they virtually, in his view, led no, no longer led an independent existence and everything that they did was entirely devoted to their brother. Now, with all mythology, it's, it's very easy to poke holes immediately. And so I, it, there's plenty of material uh, to draw on to really get a different perspective on how the Uliano family functioned. If we could have the next slide. Um, I spend a lot of my time talk, talking about um, the family trees of revolutionaries. So this is the Uliano family, Ilya and Maria, the parents. Ilya dies when the children are teenagers. So um, yeah, I'm afraid he ent exits the scene. Um, the first thing I, I would argue with, uh, with about the Uliano family is that, of course, Vladimir was not the, the starting point, the pioneer of their revolutionary involvement. Anna and Alexander were the two oldest siblings, and they went off to university in St. Petersburg first. And they were the ones who first became involved in revolutionary activity. Alexander famously, of course, is hanged for his involvement in a plot to assassinate Alexander III, an, an, a thwarted plot, I should say. After his death, then Anna is sent into exile to her home. And it's she that introduces Vladimir and Olga, the next two children in, in the family, to her rev the revolutionary ideas that she came across and her revolutionary contacts. Sadly, Olga dies when she's 20, uh, so she also exits the scene. But from then on, Anna, then Vladimir, Dmitry and Maria all entered the revolutionary movement. And it very quickly became clear that they all had their own contribution to make to revolutionary activities. So Anna and Maria were both revolutionary organisers, and by that I mean that they would, wherever they were in Russia, they would be setting up revolutionary party cells for the Bolsheviks, conducting correspondence between revolutionary party, party cells in other cities, um, distributing illegal literature and fomenting strikes and so on. Both of them were arrested and imprisoned and exiled during their, uh, the underground period. After 1917, they continued to have independent careers. Maria worked for the state newspaper Pravda and was a close associate of Bukharin. She was also involved in the RABCOR or the Worker Correspondence Movement. Anna worked for the Department for the Protection of Childhood and then went on to work in Istpart, which was the history of the party section, which uh, oversaw the creation of, of a Soviet approved historical canon of the history of the revolution. And in that capacity, and both of them um, being involved in this part, in fact, both of them wrote these stories of Lenin, um, reminiscences of Lenin that were uh, a, you know, suitable to the ideology of the regime. But when we go back, when, I, when you go back to their letters and, and the primary sources about their lives before 1917, you can see that far from being a solar system structure, the family was actually simply a mini revolutionary network within the revolutionary movement. They're equally concerned for each other's welfares. There's mutual benefits to be had for being in contact with each other. Um, remember that Lenin is a fairly highly isolated figure for, for much of his early revolutionary career, where so his family networks are actually quite important. And the family ties extended beyond sibling relations. Um, Maria, their mother, rolls up her sleeves and gets involved with the revolutionary movement. Um, and Anna um, and Dmitri bring in their, their spouses. Anna adopts a child who's also drawn into the revolutionary movement. So it be increasingly became clear, if we can move to the next slide, that the notion of the kind of the lone male revolutionary functioning as a committed party member was really a myth in, it, in its entirety. So that we had to understand that revolutionaries were actually supported by these family networks. Um, and I increasingly found examples of lots of these revolutionary families. If we could just go to the next slide, by one of these lovely historical flukes, Lenin's great rival Martov of the Menshevik party has an almost identical experience. Again, a large family, progressive uh, parents. It's Martov himself who um, is first drawn into the movement. And then as a matter of duty, he pulls in his younger siblings, Lydia, Sergei, Vladimir, and they all join um, revolutionary activities. 
So that really sort of set me thinking about um, how best to um, to think about this, the revolutionary movement. Obviously, I am the latest in a long line of scholars who've written about women's involvement in Russian politics. There's, there's a sort of 50 year historiography there. Um, but it remains fairly distinct from the general narrative of the Russian Revolution, which does remain focused on male leaders, male workers and soldiers and so on. So I began to think that the family networks approach was one that would enable me to deal with men and women simultaneously and bring them both into the story of the revolution. Um, so if we could just go on to the next slide. Um, so I began to think of this new model. You can see I've gone crazy with the, with the, um, the graphics today. So you can see that I wanted to think of the parties as much bigger than had been originally thought of. Um, yes, you've got your central sort of professional revolutionaries, but family members also are around this structure and need to be taken into account. So I looked at autobiographies and memoirs. I looked at histories of particular party cells and I actually began to see that there was a, a, a wealth of material that spoke about the family, the party in this way. Lydia, Dan, Martov's sister, in fact, said that the revolutionary parties functioned like a family where everyone knew everyone and all their relatives as well. And this was true of revolutionary parties across the political spectrum from terrorist groups um, like the Socialist Revolutionaries right through to the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. So for the next few minutes, then, let me talk you through the kinds of, of relationships um, I found and also the types of ways that family connections could help the revolutionary movement. So if we could go on to the next slide, Nicola. We'll start with sympathetic siblings then. So here's a couple of examples then. We have uh, Lydia and Vera Figner, um, inspired by their progressive uncle. They both went off to Switzerland to study medicine because they weren't able to do it in Russia. And um, through, the, through going to Switzerland, they met other uh, Russian women who were equally radical in their outlook. They formed the Fritja Circle, which looked at ideas about how to reform Russia. Um, and having completed their studies, both of them went back into Russia, worked together to help found Land and Liberty, one of the early revolutionary parties, and then significantly recruited their own younger sister, Yevgenia, to join them. And you can see here Pyatnitsky, a Bolshevik, talking about his own entry into the revolutionary movement. And he, here he's talking about his brother's revolutionary group. At first, they used to turn me out of the room, but later I became a rightful, though silent member of all these gatherings. About that time, raids and arrests began. The active members of the self-education circle who used to gather at my brother's house began to entrust me with conspiratorial and responsible commissions, such as carrying literature from Kovno to Vilna, delivering packages and so on. So you can see there's almost um, a sort of um, a system of progress of how you properly enter the movement. So sibling relationships then were fundamental to recruiting party members. Once one sibling joined, it was, it was highly usual for more siblings to follow. They worked together as, as partners within revolutionary cells and they could also they were also in a sort of privileged position to be able to conduct correspondence family correspondence could provide brilliant cover for sending um coded party messages illegal literature and so on and so forth okay so from siblings then let's move on to spouses so if we could just go to the next slide um our helpful husbands so Again, another, a very common way for, for men and women to be recruited into the movement was, was through love and marriage. Um, if one spouse was already in the revolution, revolutionary movement and then married, again, it made sense to bring that companion into the rev revolutionary circle as well. Similarly, revolutionaries found love within the party cells. And once these spousal, spousal couples were made, they were uh, highly useful to the functioning of the movement. Um, for example, so family life, families in, in a flat could, could look innocent and respectable and quite often party cells were set up around a family home where there'd be say an illegal printing press or a bomb making factory and that appearance of respectability was a great shield for attention. Similarly, when uh, re revolutionaries were arrested, 
very few people could actually keep in contact with them and spouses were one. So spouses had access via correspondence, they could send parcels in. So they were sort of fundamental for ensuring that prisoners survived their time in prison. Similarly, they had the right to accompany spouses into exile, again, to help them survive those kinds of punishments. Um, they could also petition for mitigation of their circumstances. So spouses were highly useful. Um, here I've got the, the tangled story of the Arman family. So Inessa was uh, ad adopted into the Armand family and um, once grown up fell, uh, fell in love with the elder brother of the family, Alexander, and she had four children with him. Now together they had a progressive outlook and were involved in philanthropic activities in Russia, but gradually they fell out of love and Inessa fell for the younger brother Vladimir and had a fifth child with him. And both of them then immersed themselves in Bolshevik politics. And what's interesting is that, the, that Alexander appears to have shown no bitterness about this or any upset, in fact, continued to look after the children if Vanessa was on party missions and also vouched for her while she was imprisoned as well. So if we could go on to the next slide, spouses were so useful to the revolutionary movement that when genuine spouses couldn't be found, they made them up. Um, here we've got Praskovya Ivanovskaya of the People's Will, remembering that they set up a conspiratorial flat. She was to pose as the, the, the wife of Nikolai Kilbacic, and another woman, uh, Lila Terenteva, was to pose as a poor relative working as their servant. And together they worked together to plot an assassination attempt on, um, uh, let's see, it would have been Alexander II at this point. She just highlights there that um, it, although usually revolutionaries prided themselves on being able to get along with any other revolutionary, when you were involved in the serious business of setting up a fake fiance, you had to make sure he was all right and that um, you were all going to get along in the flat. And Deutsche also remembers that similarly, if a prisoner, if there was a revolutionary prisoner that, that uh, people were aware he that didn't have a fiance to visit, then again, they made them up. And he recalls that it occasionally happened in this way that an awkward situation came about if a young man or a girl in prison appeared to be betrothed to two or more different people. Um, but there's, there's letters from Lenin saying, oh, such and such a, a prisoner, you know, doesn't have a doesn't have a fiance. Can you send someone in to bring his bring them parcels and, and books and so on? OK, so if we could move to the next slide um, and I realise that the alliteration is getting out of control, but I'm just not sorry. <laughs> so we've got persuaded parents now. Um, so as I said already, as, as with Lenin's mother, quite often it was widowed mothers. There are some fathers who get involved, but usually it's widowed mothers. They would roll up their sleeves and get involved. Um, and it could be on a spectrum. So obviously uh, under the legal system in Russia, you had an obligation to report relatives who were involved in revolutionary activity to the authorities. So at the very least, parents could choose not to do that. And that did actually make them fall foul of the law, even though they weren't always prosecuted for it. They could support their revolutionary children financially because obviously they lived highly disrupted lives and couldn't hold down jobs very easily. But sometimes they, these, these parents went even further. They would run safe houses for revolutionaries who needed somewhere to stay if they were on the run. And uh, older women in particular realised that um, the police barely glanced at them when they walked around town. And so they often ended up smuggling illegal literature. And Eva Broido, a Menshevik, offers a really wonderful vignette of all these women, these older mothers involved. Um, she's an absolute case herself. When she's down in Baku, which is a sort of an oil town, um, she sort of describes it like being like the Wild West. And so she used to go around with a pistol in her pocket and so on. But here she sort of gives us a really lovely insight into the involvement of mothers. So she says, when I had to go alone somewhere or to travel by post coach, I used to improve my general appearance by stuffing my pockets with sunflower seeds and assuming that could not care less look that goes with them. Soon I began to use these trips for transporting illegal literature. I tied the leaflets into a kerchief and put the bundle at the bottom of a basket. She tops it up with domestic items. And then once in the coach, cracks the seeds and offers these seeds to everyone else around. So she looks entirely innocent. And then here's the bit that always made me prick up my ears. She says, I learned this touch from the mother of my hostess, a woman of about 65 who spent most of her time transporting illegal literature. But she did not mind taking on any other work for us. And at one time she deputized for another mother as the owner of the flat in which our secret printing press was lodged. So you can see here that there was real involvement from, from the mums. Um, okay, if we could go on to the next slide. Um, we've got complicit kids and then I promise I'm going to stop on the alliteration. Um, so where there was love and marriage, there were, of course, children. Um, some 
revolutionary parents um, chose to give their children away to others to care for them because they wanted to protect them from their dangerous lifestyle. But in just as many other cases, if not more so, revolutionary parents kept their children with them. So from an early age, then the children had to be trained not to give the game away if there were police searches. Um, and the parents write in their memoirs about all the various techniques they used. Um, one mother famously spread hot mustard on her daughter's tongue when she thought she had been indiscreet about um, a visitor to the flat. But revolutionaries also miss no opportunities to use children as, as, a, as a disguise. So there were bombs hidden under children's beds, revolutionary literature was put in dolls and toys. Um, and we've, there's even an example of a family uh, putting uh, bullet cartridges in these belts across the children's chests, giving them brand new coats to wear. And then the, the, the family traveled to another city and with the children carrying these bullets for the revolutionary movement. Again, because they knew that children looked more innocent. And if we could just hop to the next slide. Um, children were often instrumental in facilitating revolutionaries escaping from exile in Siberia. Um, so you, there's lots of photographs of uh, Russian revolutionary exiles who took their children into exile with them. There's Sverdlov with his son in Siberia in 1915. It's such a common sight, it even makes its way into art. So there's Yaroshenko's life goes on and they're going off into exile there with, with a small child. And lots of escapes, as I say, were facilitated by children. Um, Trotsky, for example, when he was exiled, um, had his wife and two children in, in exile. He noticed that there was lack security because he says the guards would not believe he would abandon his family. But of course, his, his wife was also committed revolutionary and she said go and so she and the children covered for his absence and he escaped off to Europe. Um, she possibly regretted it because from then on Trotsky took up with another woman whom he had a family with so um, but but um, families that you can see there were, were a, a source of disguise and if we just hop to the next slide there's another example Maria Sukloff um, she had been in exile alongside a, a family, a couple with one child, and they all wanted to escape. So they sort of did a bit of a switcheroo for, to help their disguises. The couple left the child with Maria, and they escaped successfully, and then she travelled with the infant. And she said, the child proved the best protection from the searching eyes of the police and gendarme. The spies who swarmed at every big station did not pay the least attention to me. They evidently could not think of such a combination. When we came to Chelyabinsk and had to change trains, our car was suddenly locked and the passengers were let out singly, their passports examined. I held the child in my arms and the gendarme passed me without question. So then family life, family members were a, a constant presence in revolutionary activities um, and in, in genuine sort of political moments. So if we just hop to the next slide, Valentinov crops up again. He talks about the meeting of the 22 Bolsheviks. This is Lenin relaunching the Bolshevik party with 22 supporters in 1912. Valentinov notes the presence of wives there um, and says that they gave the, the, the meeting a homely appearance. But all these women were, were activists in their own right. So yes, connected by marriage and by um, uh, siblinghood um, to other members of the 22, but, but very much genuinely there as activists in their own right. And if we just hop to a, a photograph, this is the this is this photograph is the cover of my, my book on the family networks. This is a very famous photograph. This is Lenin and the Bolsheviks crossing Stockholm on their way back to Russia in 1917. Um, obviously, they went via the sealed train. Um, and again, it's very easy to think of Lenin traveling with only male fellow party members. But actually, if you look at the photograph, you can see um, his wife Krupskaya is there, Ines Armand is there. There was lots of other married couples who have listed down the side of the slide. And you can see Zinoviev holding the, his son's hand there in the light coat. Um, so, in fact, even this, this, this revolutionary moment, this return of Lenin to Russia um, at the start of the revolution also brought back this kind of family grouping of, of other committed Bolsheviks who were also on their way back to Russia. One, one sidebar that um, is perhaps interesting to note is that historians have kind of scratched their heads a bit about why Stalin went after the wives of his political enemies. It's always seen as a slightly paranoid and extreme action. 
And there's been lots of theories about why he did it. Some historians have Stalin looking back to Ivan the Terrible, who would root out the clan of the boyar enemies that he faced. Others have posited that the arrests of lots of male political enemies created a group of resentful women who had to be dealt with. Um, there's even the belief that family members were likely to absorb the same oppositional ideas. But I would argue, in fact, that it's very much the practical memory of how families supported the revolutionary movement before 1917. And as Stalin um, begins to fear uh, uh, treachery in, amongst his party, treachery around him, he, he has that memory in his head, which is why they go after the families. And if we just hop to the next slide, just I've got a couple of pieces of evidence to show you on that front. So in the Red Terror that Lenin orchestrates in July 17, 1922, you can see here Lenin writing to Stalin, uproot the Mensheviks, the evolved Radchenko and her young daughter said to be malicious enemies of Bolsheviks. So Lenin there casting uh, opponents in family settings as, as, as da dangerous. And then 1937, the NKVD order 00486 against enemies of the motherland um, directed um, the NKVD to arrest anyone who lived with the arrestee, the political target, but then also to search the flat for weapons, explosives, copying equipment and revolutionary literature, which all sounds highly paranoid in, our, in the narrative of um, the terror of the 1930s, but these are precisely the kinds of items that you would have found in revolutionary flats um, before 1917. So I think there's a historical continuity there. Okay, so having written those two novels, um, I then took a career break and this sort of opened a door in my brain that enabled me to turn to some fictional writing. Um, it certainly wasn't it certainly wasn't a strategic move to explore women's history from a different angle, but my research has unquestionably influenced how I wrote my, my novel. So if we just hop to the next slide, Nicola, that'd be great. Um, so I made some decisions sort of almost immediately when I decided to write this novel. I, I, I was determined to centre my story on the daily lives of revolutionaries, and I was wanted to sort of put the family network discoveries that I've made into practice. So my key characters are twins, Boris and Rosa, who meet this, a student, Anna, and recruit her into the movement. I also wanted to have a homosexual love story in it, since, since I, even though I've gone through many, many memoirs, I've never encountered any kind of hint at a homosexual relationship, mainly because these the memoirs that I've used were uh, offered to the party or to, for publication in an official capacity. Um, but it's, it's highly likely that there were homosexual relationships. And so I wanted to let my historical imagination run free on that front. Um, I also decided that I wanted to stick to the relatively hopeful era before 1917. And I certainly don't want to write about Stalin, which you kind of have to do if you do the Russian Revolution as a, as a scholar. But as a fiction writer, you can decide that you can just miss that bit out. So. And so the result uh, is Blackbird's Song. And I'll just read you the blurb from the, black, the back to give you an idea of, of what it involves. Um, and I'm certainly happy to answer more questions about what's in the novel um, afterwards. So it starts in 1903. It's a time of war with Japan, shortages and revolutionary sentiment. Anna enrolls at university and is befriended by twins Boris and Rosa, who draw her into the revolutionary movement. And I chose not to do the Bolsheviks, who've really been the centre of of my focus, but rather the socialist revolutionaries, um, because they were the terrorist party. So as Anna finds new purpose to her, her life and falls in love with Rosa, the violent campaign against the Tsar escalates. On the 9th of January 1905, a workers' protest is massacred by Tsarist soldiers, with tragic results for the three friends. And of course, Bloody Sunday, the 9th of January 1905, also sets off the 1905 revolution. So Anna now must continue the revolutionary struggle, knowing that to do so will mean sacrificing everything she holds dear. So just for the last 10 minutes or so of my, of my talk then, I wanted to sort of do some comparisons of, of what it was like to write for the, uh, about the Russian Revolution in a scholarly way, and then also to do it through historical fiction. And um, I just wanted to start by looking at the sources. So one of the things that my scholarship uh, revealed was that although uh, party uh, party member memoirs and autobiographies have a, a reputation for being 
entirely dedicated to party life and not to private life. You know, the, the idea that it wasn't suited, wasn't um, appropriate or acceptable for members of the Soviet collective to write about their private lives. In fact, they did a great deal of um, uh, homosexual experiences notwithstanding. And actually, the more I read um, autobiographies by party members, the more I found um, nice amounts of evidence about what family life was like. And sometimes sources were startlingly candid and open about emotional ties and emotional aspects of family life. And if we could just hop to the next slide, I'll give you a couple of examples. And all of these sources fed into both my scholarly research and my um, my novel as well. So, for example, Smirnov, a Bolshevik, um, writes a whole article basically about his mother, Njurgen, who um, she also smuggled illegal literature. And he tells a great vignette of she's got her basket of illegal literature over her arm and she got caught up in a student protest, um, which was then cordoned off by a gendarme. And she simply went up to the nearest gendarme and said, you know, I'm a little old lady and I need to get my train. And he just let her out and off she went with her illegal literature. But he admits quite candidly, if I succeeded in doing anything for the party, then it is to her, my mother, that I am indebted to a significant degree. I do not doubt that it was because of her constant care that I successfully avoided prison and exile in those years. And even Valentinov, who was so scornful of the, the solar system Uliano family, admits that he decided for purely personal reasons that he would not stay quietly in prison and says, perhaps it, would, it will be seen that these reasons were justified if I explain that I'd been married only a few months after my, before my arrest. And so he, he actually genuinely did risk everything. He went on hunger strike, um, which ensured, as he hoped, that he would be exiled somewhere. And then, of course, wives had the right to join their spouses in exile. So, so lots of family details and life, life details in these memoirs. But once I started writing fiction, I realized that some of my research was sort of woefully inadequate because I needed to know things like, well, what curtains would people have in their homes and how did they get drinking water in St. Petersburg and where did the, where did the cool elite eat out on a Saturday night and so on. So it was really wonderful to try all sorts of other source repositories. Um, I have to say, um, students don't pay attention to this. The internet was my friend. There were lots of uh, vintage photographs. There were um, blog posts about um, tradi Russian traditions and Russian cuisine and so on. Um, lots of websites about the historical, the historic towns of, of, of Russia. Um, but even something like Google Maps was helpful. So, you know, if you want to know how long it's going to take your characters to walk across town, then you just put it into Google and, you know, where, where the historical centre of St. Petersburg is largely intact, you can, you, can, you can find out these lovely little extras. Um, so in terms of sources, then, two different, very different types of source bodies to use for my, for my writing. But what about my, my raison d'etre? What about this integrating women into the narrative? Well, to me, academic history, and certainly where the Russian Revolution is concerned, just hasn't found a way to properly integrate women. The separate section or chapter is still a deeply unsatisfactory technique, even though we all do it either in our modules or in our, in our work. Um, there's also, where the revolution is concerned, um, the sort of classic divides between public and private, the notion of high politics, the factory floor, and it, it puts blinkers on to the presence of women in these spaces where they're not expected, even though women were participating in politics by this point, even though women were on the shop floor in, in, in Russian industry. There's also that tendency not to acknowledge that even if women aren't present, male politicians, for example, spend a great deal of their time saying what ought to be done about women. So, um, you know, the Bolshevik committees looked at how women's lives could be changed and improved. There was all sorts of debates and discussions around divorce rights and so on. But again, even as the male politicians deal with those kinds of topics alongside questions of war and diplomacy, the women issues get separated out from the male activities and, and left to, for the women scholars to deal with. Now, Moira Donald did some excellent research on this. Um, if we could just go to the next slide. Um, so she looked at the, the number of times or the percentage um, appearance of uh, key women um, in 1917. And she looked at eyewitnesses accounts of the Bolshevik seizure of power and then Western histories through the 20s, 30s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I then carried on the research and looked at the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. So these are the these are the central committee members. There is only one woman. There's Colin Ty, 
But you can see that even though she was highly famous in her day, quite a controversial figure and quite famous, she gets very little space in the narrative. And I popped Krupskaya in there as well, just because obviously as Lenin's wife, she was similarly well known. But you can see that they just do not hold a candle to the key figures of the revolution, but not even to some of the lesser known. So somebody like Luna Sharsky, who was the head of enlightened the education department, um, you know, even he gets a better look in than the women. And if we just go on to the next slide, I decided to use Moira Donald's methodology and look at um, some key women figures um, beyond the Central Committee of the Bolsheviks and see how often they appeared in books about the Russian Revolution in the 90s, the 2000s and the 2010s. And I should confess that I, I stopped before 2017 with this research. So that's the next step is looking at the publications from 2017. But you can see that women barely feature in the histories of the Russian Revolution. Even famous people like Catherine Breshkovskaya, the grand dame of the revolution, um, people like uh, Lenin's sisters barely feature. Maria Spiridonova has a slightly better showing. She was the leader of the left SRs in 1917. But you can also see that um, there's also the worrying trend that the 1990s seem to have been the high point where women are mentioned in general histories of the Russian Revolution and tailed off terribly by the 2010s. The, the lull in the 2010s is possible because everyone, of course, was holding back their publications for 2017. And I'm, hap and I'm hoping that when I get to do 2017 publications that I will be overjoyed to see women everywhere. But you can see then that you, um, constant vigilance is needed to make sure that women remain present in um, the history of the revolution. With fiction writing, I was much more at liberty to be able to move between the kitchen table and high politics and onto the street and into the shop floor so that wherever women were found, I could integrate them into my story. And if we just hop to the next slide, um, in particular, because I looked at the terrorists, I could bring in lots of real terrorist women who were very prominent in um, 1905. So here on the bottom left, you've got Anastasia uh, Bitsenko, um, who was a, a terrorist, but went on to be part of the negotiating team that went to Brest-Litovsk to end Russia's involvement in the war. Well, on the bottom right, you can see the six, uh, six terrorist women who all made attacks on government officials in the 1905 revolution and then were transported into exile in Siberia and were feted at every train station. And I can also show how these women interacted with the wider politics. So at the top there, you can see the assassination of one of the ministers of the interior. And there's Azef, um, the head of the combat organization of the socialist revolutionaries he coordinated the socialist revolutionaries terrorist attacks, but also famously was um, an Okhrana secret police agent as well. Okay, so my last comparison then is with audiences. How, it's all very well integrating women into the narrative of the Russian revolution, but how do you get that out to an audience successfully? So for fiction writing, the, the obstacles are, are almost insurmountable. Um, a tiny proportion of would-be writers get published and an even tinier proportion of them um, are taken up by a publisher who has the clout and the finances and resources to be able to promote your book widely on a national scale. So I'm of course delighted that Stairwell Books, my lovely indie press in York, took up Blackbird's song, but all my promotion has had to be done by me, essentially, and I can't take on places like, like Amazon. So there's real problems of getting your story out to the public. And of course, if we could just move to the next slide, famously, men don't read women authors. Um, a recent study in 2021 highlighted that for the top 10 best-selling female authors, who include Jane Austen and Margaret Atwood, as well as Danielle Steele and Jojo Moyes, only 19% of their readers are men and 81% are women. In contrast, for the top 10 best-selling male authors, who include Charles Dickens and Tolkien, as well as Lee Child and Stephen King, this split is much more even. So I've, I've kind of hamstrung myself by using a, my female name as author of my novels, that it will almost certainly not be read by men. J.K. Rowling had it right by going with her initials. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a habit that's historically been present from George Eliot on. So... Surely it stands up better in scholarship, though. Surely we are all part of an enlightened, inclusive, 
um, feminist institution that's in favour of equality for men or women. But I'm afraid academia doesn't work out so well either. And if we just hop to the next slide, um, we're all well aware of the imbalances that, that can be found in um, module bibliographies. And I know we all work very conscientiously to to, to redress it. Um, but similarly in citations, women academics are far less likely to be cited. So here is the scene on for the uh, um, discipline of international relations. The big blue dots are uh, articles authored by males. The green dots are authored by females and the red dots are um, authored by at least one male and at least one female. And you can see here overwhelmingly that male authored articles and pieces of work are overwhelmingly cited. So I thought, well, surely not in my own discipline. So off I went to the Russian Revolution. And if we could just hop to the next slide. So what I did was I did a, a quick look. I picked out the, the top 10 um, female scholars on women's involvement in the Russian Revolution who've been working, as you can see, since the 70s. Um, and have, many of them have published multiple works. And I looked at the bibliographies of the same books as I've been using throughout these tables to see how many get men get cited or get get included in the bibliography. And you can see it's a very, very poor showing. Women are, are not being consulted in these general texts on the Russian Revolution. And I can see you're all you're all Clements has just about broken the glass ceiling there or whatever, or whatever, however we're going to call it. She's she's broken through with her work on Bolshevik women. And so has Stites. Um, but Stites is Richard Stites, whose book um, in 1978 on women's involvement in Russian politics is it's an absolute showstopper. Don't get me wrong. But it's really interesting to me that the male author is the one who has by a whisker has the most references. So where does that leave us then? Well, if Gerda Lerner was writing a report about uh, women's involvement in the women's history and the Russian Revolution, I think she'd be writing could do better and must try harder. Women's scholarship on uh, the Russian Revolution is flourishing, but I think it has a long way to go before it can abolish itself, safe in the knowledge that women have established their place in the Russian Revolution. And that's me. Thank you very much, Katie. That was wonderful. Really, really um, enjoyable talk and some interesting, shall we say, statistics uh, to, to ponder over as well. Um, it was it was brilliant to see how you integrated the the data into your into your discussion. That was that was fascinating, um, both in terms of the, the sort of end point where you were looking at, at citations and things, and and earlier on as well. Um, so, so yes, thank you very much. So we've got plenty of time for some questions. I'm sure there there's lots because uh, there's lots to to chew on there um, in in all that was discussed. So I will throw the floor open. Uh, feel free just to unmute yourself and come in if you want to. There's not too many of us here, uh, or if you'd like to put a question in the chat, feel free. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um... Yeah, it's when you were talking about the men going into exile and their families going with them. I mean, it couldn't have been a pleasant experience for any of them. And I just wondered, was there an expectation that the women went? Did they have a choice? Um, that's a great question. So the history of women following their spouses into exile starts with the Decemberist revolt in 1825. And in fact, at that point, the government really didn't want the wives to follow their husbands into exile um, and it was viewed very much as a political statement of support for them and um, it was one of the very few grounds that women were given to divorce husbands if they were sent into exile. Um, it's, it's, no it's not a pleasant ex experience. Um, if you were lucky enough to be in what's called administrative exile then you would be in um, urban centres where you could still work. You'd be banned from certain occupations, but you'd still be able to work. Um, and you get these extraordinary stories of, of um, some revolutionaries in exile sort of carrying out anthropological studies and, and so on and so forth. For others, though, they were simply in, in the absolute back of beyond thousands of miles, even from the nearest railway station. And it was dreadfully hard. But what you see is that almost overwhelmingly, it's the poor souls who go alone. Um, who suffer the most in exile. And if you have that bit of normality, then you've got a much greater chance of surviving it intact. And lots of revolutionaries deliberately marry, like for example, so Lenin and Kripskaya's marriage is often portrayed as a marriage of convenience. They were not married. 
when they both went to prison, but they deliberately chose to marry so that they could be in exile together. And lots of marriages were made official um, en route to exile. So it, it was unpleasant. Um, it took a toll on children's health, for example, if children went to, um, but it, I feel like it was the, the, the best option out of, a, out of bad choices if you, if you could take someone with you. And some people thrive. So when Ava Broido goes off into exile, she becomes the hostess for all the local solitary male revolutionaries. She has a regular salon with them, um, cooks for them and so on and creates a sort of whole community. So they could really be lifesavers. Um, Well, thanks for that, because I must admit, um, this is my first lecture about Russia in any form, so I find it very interesting. Thank you. Good. Thanks very much, Helen. Yes, there is a couple of um, a couple of comments in the chat as well saying thank you. And, and again, another student saying um, it was an introduction to Russian history for them, which they enjoyed. So that's great. Uh, Grant. Hi. Um, you mentioned about when women would essentially take the kind of act as like a, a pseudo spouse um I, i'm curious to what extent women really had agency in that so if they're working within let's say party lines and engage in revolutionary activity and they didn't like this individual were they still somewhat coerced into it i'm curious of how much of a free choice if there's any literature on that in general um I would say plenty, um, you know, really these were, you know, and, and often it's the women pushing to be involved in terrorist plots, you know, they want to prove themselves, they want to be involved. Um, and um, sometimes the relationships became loving, but at the same time, they could also be co conducted entirely on a pro professional lines. Um, and um, on the other, and the other thing to bear in mind, of course, is that you know they're they're often quite amateurish in some of their activities. So that you know, if things were going to break apart, then they could quite straightforwardly, you know, the, the party cells could break up. Having said that, um, even as all the revolutionaries signed up to women's equality on a theoretical level, what you find is that there's a clear gender division in terms of how these conspiratorial flats are run, whether they're fake fiancés or whether they're genuine spouses. So the women folk are often left to um, make the food and clean up the flat and, and do the sewing for, for the group while the men folk sit down and write their pamphlets and so on. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, but even for, for somebody like Krupskaya, who's Lenin's wife, you know, Lenin is the leader, the speaker, the participant in conferences, and she's the party secretary who does all the correspondence, the coding and encoding and decoding of letters which of course is the lifeblood of the revolutionary movement. They all have to be in touch with each other, but of course it has none of the glamour or the glory of the um, party conferences. Um, and so yes, there, there is that constant gender imbalance that we have to acknowledge. And some women break through it, like Colin Ty, for example, who, who's a theorist in her own right, Ava Broido, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't let any kind of gender norms contain her, but, but, the, but it is present. So you're quite right to flag it up, Grant. Yeah, it was just, I, I was very curious if some, like, you know, you sometimes see similar arguments appear in, like, the com uh, the comments um, in the American Communist Party about the question of domestic work, and that became a big mm -hmm. thing, you know, yeah. you've seen a lot of men dismiss it as, like, drudgery, not productive labour, and whereas a lot of revolutionary women at the time were going, hey, hang on a minute here, boys, yeah. I think you're mistaking something here for how much we're doing, and it's yeah. just interesting to see that that still arguably even to this day is still a concurrent problem so oh, yeah absolutely it's interesting to see kind of a, a, a cohesion or a consistency in this issue sadly i guess but yeah yeah the theory and practice there's always a gulf isn't there um brilliant thanks um katie there's a, a question in the the chat there from from lynn for you um so um so there are examples of family members not uh, seeing eye to eye. So I, I found the odd parent who reports on their child, for example, um, where spouses are concerned. Um, I've got some examples of spouse uh, couples where it's not so much that the wife then goes off and reports the husband, but in fact takes on a different political viewpoint. Um, so the famous example is Sukhanov, who was essentially on the sort of socialist revolutionary side. He's the great chronicler of the revolution. Um, 
and his wife did not hold with socialist revolutionary politics and was a Bolshevik. And there is, of course, the famous occasion where she sends him off and, and says, don't worry about working late tonight, dear, you know, feel free to stay over at the office because back at the flat, she's hosting the Bolshevik Central Committee who's planning the October coup. So you, you, de you definitely have spouses um, who diverge in their views. The other thing that, that is important to bear in mind is that the Russians absolutely, as revolutionaries, do not follow the moral code of um, marital fidelity and loyalty to the end sort of thing. So marriages break up regularly. Lots of people um, leave one wife or one or one husband. There's plenty of it going the other way um, and form new common law marriages. Um, so in that respect there's a great deal of independence for spouses in terms of not sticking with someone that they, they don't agree with and I, I genuinely don't think i've ever come across an example of a spouse dobbing in another spouse um but then again it wouldn't necessarily make it into official party memoirs either so but no that's a good question lynn thanks excellent thanks very much um any other questions just now Yeah, Nicola, if I, if you don't mind, I, I've, I've got one. Um, thanks very much for that, Katie. It was a, it was a really interesting talk and um, reminded me of the work of, of an ex-colleague of mine, Melanie Neelich, uh, from University of Gloucestershire. Um, but I, I want to take you to the historiography and kind of the historiography that I know from the world of social protest, in a way. And um, Women and children, but women in particular, were were hugely prominent in in food riots of of all sorts across the 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 18th and 19th centuries, and yet the historiography has dealt with it rather shabbily, really, you know, and saying basically, well, you know, um, we can explain the role, the prominent role of women in food rioting, oh yeah, because that's their you know domestic role they're they're part of the uh, the market and the marketing system and, and that really is is you know a shabby way of dealing with things really but it is it, it remains one of the dominant paradigms and i'm just wondering if there's there's you know you you would say that there's something similar in 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 soviet history you know dominated i'm afraid to say by male historians and um yeah of the old school as well i suppose and and uh, yeah difficult to shift that kind of paradigm. Yeah, oh, um, and I, I know Melanie too, she was my external examiner uh, for my PhD, so yes, um, oh, I didn't realise there was a connection there. Um, oh, I'm really glad you mentioned food riots. It's, it's my life's mission to, to deal with the food, food riots in the um, February Revolution. So yes, yeah, so famously the February Revolution. Now this is the one that overthrows the Tsar. This is before October when the Bolshevik state power. Um, famously it begins on International Women's Day with women uh, writing over bread and you know they've been queuing for bread there's shortages and and they come out on the streets um for these bread riots the thing that always gets me about that is that bread riots sound spontaneous it sounds like women have been standing in a queue have got hacked off and decided to protest and riot except that it's international women's day it's not a fluke that they're out on the streets on international women's day they're also highly educated and um i mean sort of politically educated and involved um the women's suffrage movement has been going on for for years um uh, revolutionary women have been reaching out to women um petersburg in particular is full of textile industries and shop floors which are predominantly women so they know international women day women's day is coming they've got their banners ready with down with the czar yes they're protesting about bread as well but this is an organized deliberate day of protest and women are actually highly adept over the next few days of, of organizing themselves so there are two enormous marches by women um in favor of the votes for women so for example on the 8th of march which is the other international women's day date the fluke of the russian calendars means that there's sort of two days you can celebrate it Forty thousand women come out on the street on the 8th of march 1917 after the overthrow of the czar demanding the vote um, and they are extremely adept at petitioning the soviet and so on and so forth so um so I would almost I would almost argue for taking the word bread riot out of it because that's bread is mentioned, but that's not what's going on. And you're right, it's causes huge problem in the historiography because that's what students and and the general narrative keep, keeps us. You know, that's the first contact with the revolution is bread riots and women. But 
they're not spontaneous they are political they are organized and trying to overturn that narrative is is it's like trying to put, push water uphill or whatever you want to say it so yeah so yeah that was quite a long rant okay yeah i'm um, moving on <laughs> that's a great answer thank you <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, any other questions? Um, Dr. Turton, sorry, I don't mean to make your rant again, but <laughs> just just out of interest, why why is it so difficult kind of to overturn it? Or why do you think it is? Why is it difficult to overturn it? Um, in the, well, <laughs> the, we, the other problem, of course, is that in the end, you come up against the, the brick wall that the key leaders of the revolutionary parties were men. That is how the parties were organized. The men were the conference delegates. They were the theorists. They were the writers. They were the publishers. Um, they took on the leadership roles. And for both push and pull reasons, women don't come to the fore. So women are sort of kept out. But also you agree many of women many women don't put themselves forward for leadership roles either. Some do, but many of them are content to be in auxiliary roles. So for example, um, the Tsar has just been overthrown. Um, the Torried Palace is bustling with the new provisional government. Lots of women who are politically engaged, who are educated, come to the Torried Palace. And they don't say, right, we're going, we want to be on the committee for improving women's rights. They say, give us typewriters and we'll get on with typing the memos. You know, a lot of them are prepared to accept that. And so when you write the general narrative of the revolution, it's very easy to write about the decision makers and they are overwhelmingly male. And um, you sort of have to both get into the mindset that what women did was valid and useful and important to get them in there. But you also have to sort of change the whole historical mindset of, of what is actually important to this, the tides of history. You know, are women out on the streets campaigning as important as the men making these big decisions in committee rooms? And, and you're sort of pushing against all these different, different challenges. Thanks very much. I think we have time for one or possibly two questions if we have quick ones, um, if anyone has any. Um, Ian said there it's an attractive and lazy explanation. It, it's true um, that it's, you know, as historians, we are very good at repeating what has gone before as well and without noticing, you know. Um, so, um, Um, and Lynn's popped a, a comment in the chat there as well about a sort of sea change in the women see themselves in the last 10 years. Oh, yeah, it's in, um, um, so that's where we're... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's just, it's part and parcel of the conditioning that they experience as in, in, in Russia. And lots of them break through the boundaries. You know, lots of terrorist women are determined to participate in violence on equal footings to men and so on. Um, but, you know, there are also a great deal of other situations you know motherhood and household responsibilities and so on um and and that whole issue of confidence which they all suffer you know that lots of them suffer from as well you know there's all these kinds of factors at, at play as well but there's plenty of them there if you if you look for them absolutely i think that was it was a really nice thought uh, a really nice um thinking of the need to change the narrative and the, the importance of doing so and the importance of all of us as historians and students of history as well to, to think about doing so whenever we can um, and to not just do something because it's it's the way it's been done and think, oh, OK, what other approaches can I take to this? Um, how might I actually look at this through a different lens and, and be able to, to understand the the participation much more fully rather than just the base narrative of, of what gets the hits on on sort of a wikipedia page or something like that which of course you should never be going to no, anyway never. Nope. <laughs> um, okay i think um, unless there's any any last quick questions i think we might wrap up there i think that was a really nice way way to end the discussion um and hopefully somewhat hopeful um in terms of where where history might be going in the future um, but we'll just give uh, katie w one last round of applause for a really excellent talk um, and a stimulating discussion uh, lots of nice questions there um so thank you very much um katie and My I pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.
thanks so much for having me. It was really wonderful to chat with you all this evening. <laughs> You're very welcome. I've just realised I've done the terrible thing of not remembering to find out when our next History Talks live event is. Um, so I'm just very quickly trying to remember off the top of my head. Our next talk is um, from Dr Andrew Lind from the Institute of Northern Studies. We're very much looking forward to it. And I know it is in May, I just cannot remember the exact date off the top of my head. Thursday the 12th of May, there we go, I managed to search for it quickly enough. So we hope you all join us on Thursday the 12th of May uh, for Andrew Lynn's talk, which will be um, on the power of the sword, Orkney and the Carbisdale campaign of 1649 to 1650. So another really interesting talk coming up. Um, and thanks again, everyone. And thanks very much, Katie. We'll see you all later. My pleasure.